Exactly. Uh, this is the Rex Club monthly reunion call on uh, Wednesday, October 12, 2022. Hey, Micha. I like the goatee. Hey, it's, it's actually a scruff. I'm going for the one and a half millimeter scruff look. Scruff. Okay. It works. It looks Thank good. You. It looks Thanks. good. I, I would do the same, but my wife has uh, ultimate authority on these matters. Oh, nice, Jermaine. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> you, you need a baguette in your other hand. I'm sure that's a different filter. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you can do this too. Let's see. Let's so I kind of I kind of surprised April with the beard because we were apart for a month, and in that time I started doing this, and then I showed up in Madrid. I caught up with her there because she was still in uh, Portugal and Spain, uh, because her Portuguese and Spanish book uh, versions launched. Oh, nice, Kelly. Thank it's you. Subtle. It's yeah. subtle. It, and it maps to your face perfectly like it's there's no it's not amazing and slightly <laughs> alarming it happens very quickly yeah. you look like yeah. dr marks all of a sudden <laughs> true oh <laughs> nice, man. Hey. Okay. hey kevin <laughs> nice to see you it's kind of amazing um, that zoom hasn't really done more with with uh these effects yeah. And also, there should be an effect where the host or somebody can press a button and you get like a golden buzzer and, and confetti drops from the ceiling. I mean, seriously, why would you not have a golden buzzer effect in Zoom? Yeah. Right. Didn't a friend of ours go to work for Zoom on, on third-party plugins? Yes, uh, Ross Mayfield. Zap. Right. <clears throat> and I tried to contact him and he never didn't write me back. So I'll try again. Because maybe yeah. there is a plugin that'll let you do all of those things. There's got to be. And also, yeah. like, you should be able to be in a space helmet. Like, it's true. S certainly. You know that? Certainly they that one's that? here somewhere, right? Gotta be. The space helmet would be useful. Yeah, I agree. Oh, Kelly's looking like Metaverse's <laughs> new Metaverse future, where we're not going to see anybody's faces because we're going to be, like, face mapped. Yeah, the, 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 the meta helmet, okay, uh, that oh, might nice. be Ross is developing. At Google, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jamey. <laughs> well, Gary, uh, as, as the host, you can also put us into. They they have some uh, custom views. I've never used them. Go to the top right corner. Oh yeah, view. Uh, speaker gallery immersive, right? Immersive, hit immersive, yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Let's go to uh, the boardroom. Okay, we just went into. <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm going to push the button and Jamea is going to disappear into the fire pit. I think there's a classroom setting and you can move people. Uh, change immersive view. Uh, here's a classroom, seats 25. And then. Uh, Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you can move like Jamey, he's in the back now. Because he's a troublemaker. Right. Oh, this is kind of cool. I've never, <laughs> hey, hey, stop that. <clears throat> I've never used this. Change immersive view. Yeah. There's one with learning pots that seats 24. So here we can you can set people into different learning pots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a little bit like the Vulcan circles, all right, for learning. All right. This is the metaverse. <laughs> the verse. Very nice. The it metaverse. Is, it's odd that it takes away your mirrored. I'm always mirrored on Zoom, ah. and it immediately yeah. made that not happen. So I keep trying to. Oh, I shouldn't be able to high five you this way. And then there's the yeah. I don't know what I don't know what this is gonna do. Mirror, Use yeah. my video as the immersive set. <laughs> Whoa. We, we are the Lilliputians about to tie you down. <laughs> okay, that's a really weird one. I don't know why someone would want to do that. Uh, and then here's uh, the kitchen table view. Oh, this is like a uh, 
fishbowl kind of thing where you have okay. somebody in somebody in the middle and then everybody else is in the, uh, right. in the audience. You're going to show us how to cook an omelet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, got to break a couple eggs. So that would be, that'd be pretty funny to hand the hand things to each other. Exactly. <laughs> how do I stop? Oh, the immers how do I stop the immersive view? Uh, Thank you. If you go back to your gallery settings, right? Ah, upper right. Good point. <clears throat> I just uh, pick gallery view again, and there we go. We're back out of there the we go. torture mode. <clears throat> um, the torture. Did you say the torture mode? Yeah, torture mode. It's like, don't hurt me. Yeah. Um, Mika, midterms coming up, like imminently. How's your life? I'm surprised you're sort of here. Um, there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on, but you you know, um, I the, the serenity prayer is helpful. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I'm scared. I I think we, the. Let me try for the optimistic view. Um, I'm a leaf on the wind. Exactly. Nice. Yes, I think of that it's line a lot. Serenity. Exactly. When, and that's right after the, uh, the bit of space whatever has impaled him, right? Isn't that when mm -hmm. he says that? Um, the one wild card to me, uh, which is exemplified most recently by the uh, Republican first lady of Nebraska, who just announced that she is supporting uh, the Democratic woman running for the first uh, Nebraska House seat, the one that's around Omaha. Um, which is as close to a swing seat in that state as you get. Um, and she just came out and endorsed her. And I think the, the, so the women factor is the X factor in this XX factor in this election. Um, and the intensity was clearly there at the beginning of the summer. Um, and I'm hoping that we're underestimating um, uh, what it is now. And I actually was hoping uh, to collect some data on this. I've not been able to do this, um, but uh, tens of millions of women use period tracking apps. And, uh, and in general, uh, if you have a uterus, you get a monthly reminder uh, about your situation. And so the, the removal of abortion rights is really um, viscerally different, I think. Uh, I, and this came to me as I was listening to a, a podcast of a bunch of Republican uh, women swing voters in places like uh, Georgia and um, Pennsylvania and um, Arizona. And one of the women was talking, they all were upset. This is from a month ago. They were all upset about Dobbs. And, um, uh, but one woman said that her college age daughter was telling her about how she and all her friends were deleting their period tracking apps. Mm -hmm. And so what I was curious to see is, is there a way to get the data on, on the apps um, in terms of, you know, numbers going down and so on. Um, because that degree of awareness is is really really interesting, um, and does it convert into votes, et cetera? Et cetera who knows? But um, that's my only silver lining, is that somehow in the polling we're getting an undercount uh, from women and people who know women uh, and care about them, um, who will uh, you know turn out and swing. Uh, particularly suburban Republican women, but you don't see it in the way we did in 2018 when there were huge numbers of people showing up to Canvas um, I, or phone bank, whatever. Those folks are showing up, but they're not as, just not as much. So, yeah. Um. Go ahead, Kevin. Were you going to jump in? No. Okay. Um, it seems to me that that there should be like a fury in the air that I'm not detecting enough of. Um, and I was thinking like sex strike. There should be a like in any in any state that has 
repressive abortion laws, the women should just say, hey, until you fix this, there's not going to be no, no nookie until you like yeah. get this straight. I don't know, Jerry. There's something good on Netflix tonight. Um, <laughs> I mean, you, you overestimate how politically active Americans really are most of the time, um, which is we're just entertained by so many other things. We're stressed by so many other things. Getting that organized requires prior uh, organization. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, we, we, we blow off steam on social media uh, rather than organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so now I have a comment, all right? Is, 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 responding to what you said, maybe there should be more fury or more energy behind this. Um, a parallel observation is we're now, you know, not since my childhood, raising the specter again of nuclear war. Yeah. And people don't feel it. Right. So I, I sense that there's a general kind of burnishing off of our ability to uh, raise more fury because we've been the amygdala has been provoked so many times that the threshold for activation is now much higher. Right. That's an observation. No, I, I would disagree that people aren't feeling it. They aren't expressing it. Because people, anyone I actually mentioned the, poss the possibility of nuclear, you know, <laughs> nuclear um, use mm -hmm. with an exchange, just an exchange. It's just an exchange. Well, not even doesn't have to be an exchange. It would be it, the the term within within. Well, not say the industry within the field is is nuclear next use. Mm -hmm. um, okay. okay, so uh, there is, the immediate reaction is, oh my god, I, I'm just completely freaking out about it. But they aren't expressing that externally. I mean, I, and I think you're absolutely right about the. Um, yeah, we've 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 pushed the the fear button too many times. We, we we're we're wireheading ourselves and uh, push the fear it's, button too many times, and does it takes too much to stimulate it now? So it's Peter to and actually the wolf? express. I'm sorry. We're at a Peter and the Wolf moment. So I just about Peter the, the war. Wasn't issue. it Peter and the Wolf where he cried wolf and the boy who cried the, wolf? The boy who cried wolf. Okay, Peter and the Wolf. Peter and the Wolf. Else. Different story. Okay, different okay. story. Sorry. <clears throat> Just on that topic, though, and I've written about this problem, and um, Timothy Snyder, who uh, I highly recommend if you're not already a subscriber to his Substack. Um, I'm going to put the link in, but I don't know if this is just for paid subscribers or not. He made a really interesting argument that what what Putin wants with the nuclear saber rattling is to paralyze the West. Um, and that um, he actually benefits from us scaring the hell out of each other by talking about it the way we just did, which I'm absolutely guilty of doing too. Um, and he argues that he thinks that the uh, cycle uh, has begun to turn in the other way and that the um, that Putin is going to need to call uh, troops loyal to him back to Moscow. Um, to, to defend him? Yeah, that, that uh, some of the other warlords uh, or potential warlords are themselves holding their own high quality forces back. Like Kadyrov. Yeah. Uh, so it was a really, really interesting interpretation of how quickly Putin, uh, how all this could collapse on Putin's. Um, yeah. Now, it is true that, uh, you know, threatening to use nukes is a, a way of showing that he still has the power, but he still, you know, there's several more things they have to do before he, you know, can actually set one off. Yeah. Um, so but we clearly we, haven't we overestimate the, the likelihood. Yeah, so I, we haven't provoked the level of discourse. You know, when I was a kid, eons ago, right in college, I went. To, it, it, there was a guy who sat next to me in choir. I studied voice as one of the things, and it was Billy Saul Hargis Jr. Okay, the preacher. Okay, and so I went to his dad's, um, you know, to, uh, service one time, 
And he was right from the pulpit saying, we should nuke the commies, okay? And was advocating, you know, use of nuclear weapons from the pulpit. And mm. I don't see any uh, that we have provoked, you know, the, uh, the Christian right into, you know, saying, oh, well, yeah, we should use nuclear weapons too, all right? We're not back up to that threshold right now. Well, the, the, the Christian right is supporting Putin, so. No, no, I understand. I'm just saying, well, somebody, okay, some sector, right? Um, right. You know, nobody is, is uh, you know, saying, well, you know, we should, you know, that, that alpha male, you know, response is, yeah, let's do it too, all right? Uh, we're, we're clearly not there. What years, what years were you in college, Kevin? It would have been uh, 1975 through 1978. I graduated early, so. Um, I, I was in college um, 83 through 88. I, I did a five-year double major. Yeah. Um, but that was basically Reagan years. So I yeah. was in college for, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to announce that we've I've just signed legislation to outlaw the Soviet Union forever. The bombing begins in five minutes. Right. right. Right, if you right. remember that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was in the you know, Midwest, and we were, you know, we were doing all the drills and hiding underneath our you know, yeah. tables and doing all the, you know, hey, you know, let, let's get ready for the bomb to drop. Okay, when I was in grade school, mm -hmm. and the oh um, yeah, same here. So although in California, and, and, it's yeah. kind of mixed with earthquake drill. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was it was mixed with tornado drills in Oklahoma and Kansas, right? The, so. Uh, Iran at the time, all right, and Libya were still gardens, were still Edens, all right, when I was in school. And they turned into hell holes, all right, during the time that I was in school, all right? It was uh, uh, to have those people on campus because we had a big petroleum engineering school there. It was, it was really strange. We had the Shah's police as students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Perpetual. Yeah, we had these perpetual students that never graduated yeah. that were actually the minders oh, for the students, right, for the Shah of Iran at the time. It was, it, it was, a, it was a weird... But they were play. really good at volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, so to take this full circle, you know, that, that rage or the fury, um, the only people who have expressed you know, visceral concern about the fragility of democracy have been people who have experienced something else from right. someplace else on the planet. And they say, you don't understand. OK, let me, let me tell you what it's like if you don't have the kind of society that I live in now immigrating here. Right. There's no contrast effect. Part of the yeah. problem, I don't I don't know what scale to give this at all. But one of the one of the things that's popped up in my head a lot as I've watched the far right kind of take over here is that <clears throat> the people on the far right are building community uh, behind the curtain in the far right on 8chan and wherever, mm -hmm. uh, and and they're giving each other high fives and like taking virtual trophies home because they had the the meme that that won the day, et cetera, et cetera. They're a piece of why they're perfectly happy to sort of keep escalating and pump. Um, what appear to be like criminally stupid and potentially extremely dangerous points of view is that <clears throat> that wins them more praise in the community because uh, that's what the community is doing. They've, they've all discovered that if you, you know, work the media up into a froth, uh, you gain, gain attention, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering how to undermine that in the same way that I'm wondering how to undermine QAnon if it actually is an ARG. So Adrian Hahn's famous piece, about is QAnon an alternate reality game, I think is right on the money. And it got me started like, <clears throat> hey, could you pretend to be the key master? Could you, could you come in and scoop in <clears throat> and basically reroute the belief system in the story by creating some other outlandish, hopefully not AGI, Jamey, like seriously. Um, uh, hmm. Or hive, hive mind. Maybe that is the ultimate like manifestation of the hive mind. It's really QAnon. Maybe QAnon means hive mind in. I, I generally I find uh, the notion of manipulating people uh, to something that's better for them feels really manipulative. <laughs> and you know I'm at this point 
uh, short of calling for people's executions and stuff like that, like manipulation of a game where people are being manipulated, like hacking a game that is manipulating people so it manipulates them less, yeah. feels to me like a legit strategy. Okay. Well. I, I'm not. No, I feel like the, everybody who studied cults says that uh, you you don't the, the cult doesn't die because you know the prophecy fails, right? right. They just keep going. Um, and it's more that that people who know people in the cult have to sort of slowly, through personal one on one interaction, uh, offer them another path out, um, and you can. How, you, you can sort of interrupt a little bit of cultic thinking by showing people how not directly but indirectly you give them other examples of, of manipulation you know uh, that and then they on their own have to come to the realization that oh I've been manipulated um, you can't make them see that there's directly. also there's also um, social pressure plays a huge role here. There's false consensus effect or consensus bias. Uh, there were some famous experiments where uh, everybody in the experiment room was in on the experiment. There's only one subject and everybody agrees on a lie, on something that's obviously not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question, the question is, will the subject agree with them? Because everybody else seems to be saying that this is the taller person, but I can see that there's like another person who's taller or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> right. I think there's a lot of that going on. And so much of this is you're you're in you're in, how did everybody drink Kool-Aid at Jonestown? <clears throat> surely there was a queue and surely there were people dying of cyanide poisoning on the ground as everybody went up to drink their cup. Yeah. Right. Like how, how did how did we manage to get all mass delusion? Folks? <clears throat> how? That's a mass delusion. I, I, I Louis, t something surprising. I was coming back from a uh meeting last night and at the night as you know when it turns nighttime you can get long range am signals so i went to you know wcbs back in new york all right and there was an ad for a law firm in south carolina that was saying are you suffering from uh instagram addiction if you're suffering from instagram addiction call us all right we were, we're gonna you know we we're suing okay for people who have suffered from instagram addiction and i said okay this is the, you know, this is the family intervention, right, with a legal recourse, all right, um, beginning to manifest, right? The thing that has, you know, caused some of the lying to stop, right, in major media outlets is, you know, those companies who say, oh, you know, those voting systems, you know, they're, you know, they've been rigged, okay? Well, they're suing the hell out of them, right? Right. Right. And so it's the legal system is saying, oh, this is going to cost you billions of dollars, okay, for, you know, that's lying a about long us. process. It takes forever. Like the Dominion lawsuit. Well, I know, I know, Boston, but I'm just saying that. Else. And Alex Jones also, like Alex Jones is about to be deprived of his livelihood, we hope, <clears throat> we hope, but he's busy still pumping the pedals because he knows that pimping his products in, in, in the court sells more products. It's insane the amount of money that runs through. But but the whole system that supports the cult stuff that we were talking about, yeah. that is reinforced by social media. If you start to sue them, all right, because you say, hey, you know what? You know, my mom's a dis addicted, you know, to this, all right? And she didn't think it right anymore. Okay. I, I'm curious how anybody's going to sue Instagram under Section 30. I don't know. 30, but, I, I'm just yeah. saying that it's an interesting observation. That's all. Jermaine. Yeah. I don't know whether they're going to make any money in South Carolina on this or not. Yeah. It's a much faster approach would be insurance. Insurance okay. is actually faster and at least as powerful as lawsuits in terms of, of forcing change. Um, one of the biggest triggers to get police departments around the country to change behavior and training has been insurance companies pulling out yeah. and saying, we will not insure you unless you implement X, Y, Z reforms. Huh. And since in many cases, they are legally required to carry insurance for a variety of, of uh, issues, you know, they, they have, they have to change. And there, it, there was an interesting article in, I think probably the post a few weeks ago about it, but it was, yeah, insurance companies have the um, the fastest and heaviest 
hammer right now for for uh, introducing unwanted changes or changes okay. that uh, organizations have, don't so want Jamea, to have implemented. That, that, that makes sense, but I'm thinking of the gun lobby um, and how hard it is to win. Uh, I mean, I guess the, the the lawsuit against Remington would be the first one, right? Where the the uh, gun manufacturer is being held partially responsible for something. But then the mm -hmm. actuarial change tables just changed because the odds have changed, right? So the casino is different. They 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 were betting that well, you know, we're, they're invulnerable, so it's it's a low risk, right? As the insurer, the minute you start to get judgments, all right, the actuarial chain, tables change. So you may may have, you know, there may be more leverage then. So has anybody here read uh, Ryan Buse's book about um, his uh, years selling guns and then ultimately deciding to leave the industry? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard about it. Gunfight, yeah. my battle against the industry that radicalized America. Yeah, it's really interesting because, and I still haven't quite gotten my head around this, but he describes how the NRA has successfully policed the gun industry. And when there was, a, there was a moment in the late 90s where the Clinton administration uh, managed to ink a deal with Smith and Wesson, I think it was, uh, this is after Columbine, uh, where Smith, the executive uh, who was running Smith and Wesson, who was a German guy, not an American, um, agreed that they would, uh, you know, stop, I forget the details, stop selling assault weapons, but also start developing smart guns, right? Um, and one or two other, you know, install required safety features. It was just a few things that would make it harder for, you know, mass killings. And the NRA managed to stampede the rest of the industry into boycotting Smith and Wesson and Smith and Wesson capitulated. Wow. And they, uh, Blumenthal and Cuomo, and I forget who the third guy was, a couple of state AGs looked into an antitrust uh, case um, and, and ultimately dropped it. But it's the, I, I can't think of another interest group that controls its industry. Um, there's no, there, there really are no major gun manufacturers making safe guns. Okay. So there is another industry. Uh, the original diesel in, engine was designed to run on vegetable oil. And the petroleum industry said, oh, mm -hmm. no, no, no. We, we have a distillate that will make that run. All right. So they co-opted, right, what we're doing now, a century but, ago, right? But that's that's more of an individualized market. The people who there's, there's sell guns, a, it's, they're like mom and pop there's dealers. A bigger, there's a bigger conspiracy theory behind what Kevin just said, which is that Rockefeller and the oil trust basically ran the uh, prohibition because all these people had stills. Uh-huh. <laughs> And seriously, you could you could make your own alcohol, and you could right. make an engine, cool. and you yeah. could make your own gasoline. So, so the the energy needed for these new internal combustion engines was in fact producible at any place. And so, one argument for prohibition was it got rid of the competition for the oil companies. That's a really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. I yeah. like that. Yeah, me too. Okay, but because I live in Stillhouse Bottom. Theory. And the so still's I'm, right down the at the bottom of the, yeah, the still here. That, that's an example of a a very powerful industry defeating a weaker industry. Right. I'm defeating a non-industry, defeating a non-industry, non -industry, right? Nothing it. In this case, it's the NRA, which is a interest group, figuring out how to how to corral the entire industry. Now the gun lobby. The, the gun industry profits from fear, profits from whenever a, uh, a mass shooting happens, there's a spike in people buying guns because for a long time they thought, uh-oh, uh now they're finally going to crack down. We better get some, you know, get our guns because soon we won't be able to get them. Uh, those spikes in gun buying don't happen anymore because uh, the public has learned that actually 
there will be no crackdown. <laughs> mm. But the um, the idea that there isn't competition in the gun industry and a gun manufacturer who's like, we're the responsible ones, we'll sell you uh, smarter, safer guns, the NRA would kill them. Mm. I, I just don't know of another uh, example of, a, of where the interest group runs the industry so tightly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, also really important is the legislation I just put in the chat uh, mm. that basically uh, renders all smart, all, we all uh, weapon manufacturers immune from prosecution for crimes committed with yeah. their weapons. Right. Yeah. Um, and I might want to go back to the insurance thing for just a second. So yeah, I, me too. The, yeah. um, the reinsurers have had scenarios for a long time. All right. About issues. So I'm wondering, you know, how long it's going to be, and it could be immediate, all right, uh, that they said, we're not issuing policies anymore for Sanibel Island, all right, because, uh, yeah. you know, that, uh, that that is too risky a place for human beings to exist now, all right, and the primary insurers are going to get the signal from the reinsurance company saying, we're not going to back you up anymore, guys, no more backstop from us, you, you've just, you know, the stakes are too high. There's so what do we think about that? So my my amateur answer to this, uh, and I have a I have a long standing question: Why aren't reinsurance companies up our ass about climate change all the time every day? It turns, <laughs> exactly. It, it turns out that their contracts are renewed annually, so so higher risk equals higher premiums. Their business model is a perverse incentive that completely screws this up. Mm. And I need to. I, I wrote down in the thought here. Please, someone fact check me on this. But that's the closest I've come to an answer to why reinsurance companies aren't actually being socially responsible in any way at all. And I, I, I hate this fact. Yeah, I think that there's one other, um, and I haven't spent a lot of time here, but there is evidently one organization above the reinsurance companies that is their backstop, right? And God. Yeah, there, 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 there is some mysterious thing that is above oh. the reinsurance companies, and I forgot what oh, it is. But that's cool. Um, oh, turtles! It's below right. them. <laughs> well, oh, I mean, all the it's, way down. It's it's one step away from you know uh, making the risk public, right, and the government having to step in. It, there, there's another coordination you know, with the reinsurance companies. If you discover what that is, I'll let us know. I'll I'm, I'm super interested. Look wanna, at it in a second. And I want to go back well, to the insurance I, I, thing. I there has been go, some, uh, just, there, there have been some efforts on the part of insurance companies to stop underwriting uh, policies for people who live in- uh, Dangerous zones. Uh, wildland, wildland interface zones. So basically wildfire risk or flood risk. And in some, in some cases in the US, there are uh, the, Insurance companies have, have to either, they are forced by the state to, to do the policies or they have to leave the state entirely. Right. And so they, there are sometimes there are legal requirements that twist the arms of the insurance companies that they, if they don't want to leave the state and lose all of the money for the easy stuff, you know, they have to continue to do the expensive stuff. So in the interest of continuing the insurance conversation, I created this little website. I don't know if I mentioned it here, um, Penis Insurance. Um, I did this right after Dobbs, and if you want to go to the site, basically, hey, this is, we should have gun insurance. For me, forcing, make, creating mandatory gun insurance is one of the capitalist ways to maybe actually solve a piece of the gun problem in the U.S. Um, but guess what, gentlemen who own a penis, um, your weapon might go off at any time as well, and it will have a whole series of implications for the lives of the person who bears a uterus. So you may need to own penis insurance. We would like to sell you that. Very interesting. <laughs> I didn't publicize this much at all, but, uh, but uh, I don't yeah. know. So the, uh, the definition that I came up with, and, and I'll try to dig into this more, I'll send you guys a link, is reinsurers may also buy reinsurance protection, which is called retrocession. And this is done to reduce any further spread of risk and the impact of catastrophic loss events, mm, right? right? So the, I think that there is, I'll have to find the name of the association, but they have a pool that they have created a retrocession 
pool, right? Amongst the reinsurers, you know, it's kind of like their NRA, right? It's um, they they have a point of view, and they they may be backstopping each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of cross cross insuring in some sense. Um, I, I I think there's a so Jamie, you started with a lovely statement about uh, I guess it was law enforcement and insurance being a way of doing it. That caused me to create a new thought in my brain which is insurance uh, as a lever for positive change, which I did not have before. I did have a thought called, why aren't insurance companies all over climate change? But it had not occurred to me uh, until your sentence that insurance could be a lever for positive change. Um, all resources in that direction welcome. And would you want to riff on that some more? Because I think that that's a huge thing. And I think that we could create a, a general appeal to insurance companies to like clean up their fucking act. Because, because really, they're, they're a part of the problem here. They're not a part of the solution. And, yeah. and, and if, if capitalism is going to help at all, this is a really terrific lever. Well, insurance companies are in it for the money. So, you know, so if there were mandatory whatever. handgun insurance, that's a lot of dough. That's a lot of dough would come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, potentially. Uh, yeah, so I uh, I can't tell you why the insurance company isn't more activist other than the fact that they're part of the, the larger financial services industry and there's a, a strong culture of not being politically activist, of being entirely focused on the bottom line in that world. Mm -hmm. uh, so every time I've had a conversation with someone at a, an insurance company or a reinsurance company, because I actually did a project for Swiss Re about 15 years ago, um, and done some projects for a couple of insurance companies with IFGF more recently. It's always been the, yeah, we really, we really should do that. Um, but absolutely no traction on making it happen. Hmm. Um, it is too political. And, you know, until, unless and until the, their bottom line is so overwhelmed with costs that they have to step, you know, step into a political arena, you know, like, you know, like these insurance companies around the police departments. Um, and even then there's, there's a strong reluctance to do so. Um, yep, you got to make it worth their while. Mm -hmm. and, and more than just, we can make some money doing this. It needs to be, we will lose a whole bunch of money if we don't. Yeah, that's right. Agreed. Maybe they're clearly in the risk avoidance business and, you know, to the degree that they, you know, like you said, if you go in and do an audit of a warehouse and you say, well, look, you don't have enough fire extinguishers over here and you don't have enough of a, you know, they're going to try to lower the risk of that environment. And the same is true when there are human beings involved. They say, look at what you're doing. <laughs> look at how you're behaving. That's risky. Stop it. So, so. I want to question what you just said, Kevin, because I used to think that that the financial world, all the finance industries and investors and all that wanted financial stability and predictability. And then at one point it was pointed out that IBM had like a fabulous, brilliant CFO and their earnings were like super predictable and rock solid and their stock price was going no place. It was terrible. And mm -hmm. then I saw the global financial crisis where everybody piled their money onto the little uh, you know, uh, merry-go-round of CDOs and CDSs, which they shouldn't have done, but they had to do mm -hmm. because they're because everybody else was doing it and there were extraordinary returns. And then I realized that smart financial people really want volatility. They must have beta. Without beta, you make no money. Without beta, markets are boring. You don't get high returns. And for insurance companies, what I just said may be cynical, but the more the more money flows through insurance risks the more money you make. So I'm unclear that they're in the risk avoidance business. I think they're in the making money from risk business, which might mean some risks you want to delegate and get no, rid I, of. I, they're I, too I'm not going to disagree serve. with that. I'm not going to disagree with that. But <clears throat> if they if if you know they run the numbers and they can lower having to pay the claim because right. they have done a totally. behavioral intervention and done risk avoidance, then that's in their best interest. Agreed. Right? Education in that space pays big dividends for them. It's a low cost, high return activity. So why aren't insurance companies more in the education 
business? Why am I not saturated with insurance insurers trying to educate me about anything? Okay. So again, there are typologies of insurance. I would, you know, um, say to you that I am inundated by that, by my health insurers. They're doing a lot of things to try to, you know, get ahead of me having the need for medical services and interventions. And right? I'm on Kaiser and I would agree. Uh, Kaiser is so, treating me the same way. So is it likely to spread? Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't get a lot of uh, longevity advice from my life insurer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that they can de delay paying out a claim. Right. Um, uh, would it be in their best interest like the health answer. insurers? Probably. Right. Yeah. Your health insurer kind of doesn't want you to outlive your morbidity morbidity table. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't they don't they don't like they they don't want you to particularly live outlive what their estimates what their yeah, estimates I mean, said you're going to live. Same no, that's would be actually... true for my disability. All right, I outlived my disability policy, right? Uh, for a period of time, I had one for a long time because I saw what happened to people who became disabled yeah. uh, early in my career. So I took out a supplemental disability policy. Now I outlived it and I'm glad I outlived it, right? They're the winner on that table. Or on the other hand, I'm the winner because I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah um, one of the projects I did with an insurance company with IFDF was around life insurance and the dilemma of people living longer, mm -hmm. uh, of how to get, how to get people to better plan for living longer right um and so you know you're absolutely right they don't they really don't want you to be out living their yeah. their tables because you know it ends up being a real problem yeah. i mean i have an insurance policy that is hard to get now i have a long-term care insurance policy long-term care insurance policies are difficult and expensive to get right oh yeah days. And not, I have them, you know, I, I've had a long-term care you know, insurance policy for me and my spouse. It's very inexpensive, right? Premium. Uh, but I've had it for 35 years. Yeah. Okay. You and you got to so, hope that the company is still in business when you need it too. That is, I mean, it's, you know, it's John Hancock, right? And it's oh, IBM, yeah. IBM, right? It's, it's a, it's a big company. Yeah. Um, but the fact is that, they don't sell the John Hancock doesn't sell those policies anymore because right. they ran the numbers that people are living too long. Stop it. Right. <laughs> right. right. Well, long term, we, we it's not just that they're living too long. It's that you live long enough to actually need the long term care. Yeah, that and too. Then, this well, yeah, this I almost the... triggered Heidi's policy earlier this year because mm -hmm. she was they, in decline yeah. and we hospitalized her and she got some additional things done and prescribed that have put her back into a much higher quality of life as mm -hmm. an advanced COPD patient, mm -hmm. um, which I'm, you know, we're delighted. Um, but I was about to say, wow, she's going to need, you know, care, you know, uh, 24 hours a day and I can't be awake 24 hours a day. I'm a good caregiver, but I'm not, you know, yeah. um, I'm not fully functional that way. And we didn't have to do it. Um, so I'm just glad it's there. It's a great yeah. backstop, all right? Uh, but it's not available to a lot of people anymore. There was also a moment some years ago, I don't know if this was Medicare Part D or what it was, I'm forgetting, but there was some kind of insurance where you had to you had to pick ahead of time between five or six different insurance models that varied by whether you had a slow debilitating disease or a, a, a catastrophic incident or whatever like that. And there there was just no way as an ordinary human to know which of these things would play out in your life, but you had to make a choice for the plans that were weighted for one way or the other. I don't remember. I wish I remembered what it was. And I just, I just leafed through it. I, I sort of scrolled through it incredulous that anybody would force this on any, anyone. Like, like there, there's no way a human can make a wise decision on this. And if you have a pre-existing condition because you're either genetically predisposed or something has already kicked in, then they were going to deny it because it was before Obamacare, right? Before uh, portability. Yeah, but that's why, Jerry, um, in the work that we're doing over in Choice Flows is if you can ingest the, a lot of the same data that the actuaries are using to come up with the premiums and you put that over on your side, 
and create a decision support system. And they and you have access to a DSS where you can put in what you do know about yourself and your conditions. That moves you into a space where you can make a more informed you know, decision, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to just divine it out of the air, right? We did that for COVID and we're trying to do it for other health and economic development decisions, right? Cool. And you gamify the data, right? Um, because the mistake that people make is that they think um, that they're hearing something and it's generalizable to them. No, not, not necessarily the case. Um, right. I'm hearing all this doom and gloom about the economy. Well, guess what? The, right now, doesn't apply to where I live. This place is red hot, okay, mm -hmm. in terms of economic, you know, development. It's going to run counter, right, to, you know, what, what's happening elsewhere. I mean, yes, the, the insurance rate, but, you know, uh, the, the amount of investment and jobs and everything else, it's, it's crazy where I live. Amazing. Is everybody going to watch the uh, J6 hearing tomorrow? Yeah. Well, is it tomorrow? I'm going to yeah. tape it too. Tomorrow at 10 Pacific is when it starts, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's just a one episode. Uh, um, it could season. be the last one. It's it a could... one episode season. I mean, right. I don't know why they didn't get renewed, but. Um... I don't either. Well, it doesn't mean that they won't have other episodes when they have more stuff, right? But I well, think that they want to go into a dark period before the election. Well, I think they actually, right, yeah. I mean, they would have wanted to go into a dark period much earlier, but hurricane, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah they postponed for the hurricane. Yeah, well, they'll go into a dark period after the election too, so. Especially if Republicans get in control of, I know that th right. there's a lot of dynamics, right? That's that's well, there's saying. a lame duck period. Yeah. Well, I know, I know. It really no, but, does but, feel like but, you're. you're but the we're, whole, on that, we're on that part of the the river where you know the rapids are just over there. Yes, absolutely, you know? absolutely. You don't quite know how steep they're going to be. And and all the people who've been in on this commission could in fact be the recipients of overwhelming annoying and impactful lawsuits and trouble and sure. investigations themselves if the house switches yeah that i mean absolutely but you know if 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 they get tossed out or you know moved someplace else every one of them is an author okay every one of them has you know a potential different platform right because but there's like tons of books about all of this out right now, including some new ones coming out, all, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. are, are books, do books carry the weight they once did? It's not a matter of the book, all right? Book just shows that you've done the homework and so yeah. you get to be a talking head. So that's so where that, the- so that's, our, so that's the future of all these people. They become commentators on CNN and MSNBC. Or and something. Fox. They become a for humanity from that, from what yeah. we just said. Serve on a bunch of board of directors. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jen, I, I, I just caught a clip of Jen Psaki on CNN, I guess, or something like that as a commentator. I'm like, she was so much better in the White House. Well, I mean, everybody, you know, um, you know, hits their own level. When when Shep Smith left mm -hmm. Fox and went over to CNBC, he is operating at peak capacity right now. He is knocking it out of the park in yeah. that job. Um, I just watched, you know, Cuomo, right, on News Nation, and he's not good in that role, right? That it's not a good product, right? Wow. He was better, right, um, with the constraints at CNN. Mm -hmm. He was terrible there too. But well, I'm just saying that <laughs> performer, he, he was right. better than. I didn't say yeah. he was great. I'm just saying that he was better with the constraints, you know, with a better producer. He was basically given a hand. Oh, whatever you want to do. And Chris Cuomo, casual right is kind mm -hmm. of sloppy yeah so there yeah. you go um I, you know shep smith is such a professional right you know that he's producing that thing single-handedly all right and you know the format even when he's not in the chair the other people are following you know his format it's really you know it's a nice piece of of uh evening that that's what i tape and that's what i watch regularly mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's really good. Cool.
it gives you hope for what media you know can you know just to just yeah. to stay on the impact of the the committee yeah the, the the one key point i think to make is to remember that 6 9 months ago the conventional wisdom was it would have no impact um, that why are we even bothering? What we do know is that viewership went up as those hearings uh, went on. That and pub, more important than viewership, that the public said that they were paying attention. Um, and whatever that number is, sixty percent who say you know January six was serious. And there need to be consequences and people need to be held accountable. That's been a pretty consistent uh, plateau. Yeah. I don't think we can get it higher than 60%, but I'll take 60. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think we also learned that if you get a, a disciplined way of presenting the narrative, yes, it works better than a standard, you know, committee totally. coverage. Thank and if Kevin we McCarthy the, for that. Well, yeah. but if the if the Republicans get it, you're going to get Roger Ailes like production of their right. narrative. They'll try, mm -hmm. but they only get to do that if Democrats refuse to serve on the committee. Technically, the only reason that we got these hearings is the Republicans said we're taking our marbles and going home. I know, right, right. And and then you you know one party was able to stage them the way they wanted. So a couple articles recently, fully half of the Republicans running in this election cycle uh, believe in the steal. Fully half are on board and right. part of their, an integral part of their campaign is stop the steal. That seems to me like the insurrection caucus or the, the sedition caucus. And it seems to me that seditionists have not been brought to heel fast enough. And we are about to elect a whole bunch of people who are in safe districts who now will shred the Overton window, and this this has become normalized. And and mm -hmm. this is a really bad moment for that to happen. And and I wish that sedition prosecutions had been faster because I guess the Oath Keepers are confessing to are pleading guilty to sedi to sedition or something like that. Yes. yes. So it's happening. One guy. Just, but it's just, just not Jerry. Faster. Jerry. Um, saying that you believe the election was stolen is not a crime. Um, and so you, you can run for office saying you believe that. And right. if you're running in a very red district, um, you are gonna say it because that's what lots of grassroots Republicans in very red districts think. Well, worse, worse, that's the litmus test for whether your party yeah. can back you or not. Right. Right. That, that is absolutely a problem. Um, but you know, it's the same with Dobbs. You know, you get minority, a minority seizes power and you and bends it to particular ends, and then it becomes unpopular. And it's what the rest of us do with the fact that it's very unpopular. Right. That's the hard problem. Yeah. My big my big complaint about the our side in all of this um, is that we haven't come up with enough ways for ordinary people to show that uh, you know we object to this fantasy and we're you know fighting against it um, the you know you've got a bunch of groups in Washington who are you know fighting the legal battles and some quiet behind the scenes efforts to you know give election administrators support but we have very little at the grassroots level that shows that people are alarmed and have something useful that they can do. I, you know, I wrote about this little effort in one town in Pennsylvania that had uh, a march during Band Book Week uh, to elevate uh, their favorite banned books, right? Um, and what I liked about it was unlike the New York Public Library having a famous author giving a talk about, you know, the need for freedom of expression, it was something you could do in your hometown. It was fun, it was in people's faces, it was a, a, a prompt to a conversation. There, there's a reason why organizing like that is so vital because it, A, it invites people in to do something and hopefully it's fun. 
you know, you were saying, how do you fight QAnon? Well, we got to give people something else to do. That's fun. I, I think going to Trump rallies is a lot of fun if you buy the bullshit. Um, you know, they're like groupies who go from event to event because they're having a great time. Um, what's our version of that? And it, well, it, it, it's got deadheads. Yes. Well, I mean, guess, right? well, guess what? Uh, we just saw one version of that in the Los Angeles City Council. No, our version of that is not, well, that's a terrible- Well, I'm just saying that we, 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 you, you wanna see people rallying, all right, in a negative way, all right, and being pissed off, all right, yeah. is we, we just shot our, another October surprise, you know, it is that Democrats, ha, you know, have, it's like, see, they're, they've got problems too, right, kind of. We do. A lot of our elected officials are in office for too long and and stay for the wrong reasons, yeah. And, and that's what this thing just exposed. Hundred percent. Like, we're like the police bureau. We have these octogenarians in office that won't leave. It's just, bah. Power yeah. is uh, aphrodisiac, Jerry. They don't feel eighty years old. They don't look like they're having good sex. <laughs> Do you really want to go there? No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so it's viagra for fundraising all right yeah. i can still get on the phone and raise that money guys all right yeah, money is an aphrodisiac too yeah i mean they uh what was the percentage is that they spend 60 percent of their time going off site you know to their little cubby hole yeah. and raising money all right is the primary job of any legislator kissinger is still alive he just wrote a book with um Bill Gates, am I right about that? I think about so. AI? I, I just right. Yeah, sounds right. I just saw him interviewed on some, uh, or saw a clip from an interview with him just last week. Yeah, we we do live in the strangest timeline. I was thinking about you know, the idea that Elon Musk and and Vladimir Putin had a call. Uh, two of the world's richest men. Um, <laughs> I, I love the suggestion well, that you're not uh, going to use nukes. I mean, then you'll not be able to enjoy your yachts anymore. That uh, e Elon Musk should basically call him a pedophile and send him a submarine he doesn't need. Now that'll really teach him. <laughs> <laughs> Does Vlad have a Twitter account? Would you like a Twitter account, sir? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't use Twitter. It's true. I know. I'm just saying, you know. That Elon could be, you know, that, that could have been the substance of the call. You know, I'm going to own this thing. You know, would you like to be on, you know, whatever. Uh, so is anybody, if, if Elon actually winds up in power over Twitter, is anybody planning on leaving Twitter? Good question. You know, I that, don't get that much true. utility that's, out of Twitter right now. For me, it's central. For me, it's like the artery of interesting stuff as an okay. early warning I mean, system. It, it's a better early warning system than any other site I'm on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a new service for me for the most part. But right. it, in terms of it being a conversation, uh, it's not much of a conversational engine. It's, it's one way. So Jerry, if we sure. if we had something else that, that could do that for you, you would... That would well, there's there's Mastodon and a couple of uh, open source distributed uh, lookalikes, but they don't they're not really popular. They're not they're not taken off. Mm -hmm. Right, but just for argument's sake, yeah. If the thing you get from Twitter is the ability to follow not just everybody, but some you know hand curated list of smart people who you think you know extend your awareness for you, right? There's it, it would seem like, well, you know, why not create that yeah. in some other way? What's what? Why rely on Twitter for that? Like for me, I'll, I'll give you the reason why I'm, I would stay. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, though, I'd love to replace that. Um, you know, it's a distribution platform. Um, some of what I produce, uh, you know, I'm I'm valued because I have 16,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't want to just throw that away without having something to replace it with. Yeah, yeah. right. It's hard. Right. Uh, I, I'm going to wait and, and see what he does. If he actually concludes this and sticks with it, because I think those are not, those are not uh, finally answered questions yet. 
I mean, there are, this, there are still things that can happen that would that could make it not uh, finish up with him owning it. There are things where he could basically, he's bored with it now. He could just get it and then pass it off to somebody else. Um, but basically, what is he going to do? What does he do? With, if it's, is it just inviting Trump back? Well, I survived on the on Twitter with Trump around for for years. Mm -hmm. You know, I can deal with him being there because I really don't see his stuff. Um, and I'm very, uh, you know, I have a rapid finger with uh, blocking his supporters if on the occasional times I get messages from them yeah. sure. or responses from them. Um, may, I, I would say that um, I, I'm in the same camp. You know, I, I didn't subscribe to Trump. I didn't see his feed or I didn't see his supporters feed. But if he gets back on Twitter, it's to what degree does the media become reflexively covering everything that he says, right? Um, that becomes the issue is, you know, what do we do about, you know, just the stimulus and provocation, right, of, of it? And, and if they fall back into the trap, then, you know, that's, a, that's problematic. Yeah. And I agree that Musk could make it better, okay? I don't know what he's going to do, right? He's I, I have a theory. I have a theory based okay. on watching him, um, which is this is going to be interesting. <laughs> just so, from that, just from that preamble, go for it. Record again. Double record, Jerry. That's right. Yeah, record some more. Um, the positive, dangerous view is that he turns Twitter into uh, a form of direct dem democracy. And he starts holding referenda on Twitter. Hmm. That's how he often uses his account now, mm -hmm. apart from trolling the libs and, and so on. And it's one thing for him to do it when he's just one person with a big following saying, do you think this should be passed into law or not? And two million people vote. It's another thing when 200 million people vote. Um, and proxy and voting is a really interesting, like a very I, appealing. I, you and I are interested in that, Jerry. This is not that. This exactly. is the dangerous version of that. Bingo, bingo. Anybody who says to his engineering team, I want everybody on Twitter to see this, right? I want a box in the top right corner on every account that today's vote is suddenly got a, a laser beam like the eye of Sauron um, that Ooh, he can nice. use to burn all kinds of people. Right. Um, that to me is, is the potential of Elon using Twitter to blow up the shit he wants to blow up and blow out of proportion the things he wants to you know, pump oxygen into. Yeah, he's talked about WeChat as his model. The problem with the idea for WeChat is you already have it. What you got mean, all you the apps, it? you know, they're just, on, they have different colored buttons. No, Anything, no. Are one they, app I'm, to do it all. Why would anybody use that? One app to rule them all, of course. No, in China, you can live your entire life inside WeChat where the government has its nose under the tent, but, but you can do everything. You can, sure. you can book and a dog groomer. you're highly encouraged to do so. You can book a dog groomer. You can take pictures of the dog. You can, other people can, you can share it out in socials. You can pay your taxes. You can pay your dentist, the whole thing. And, and Elon sees that and he's like, we want to be that. And I think yeah. that Zuckerberg is insanely frustrated that Facebook is not that. But we yeah, already- but that in this strategy right now. Yeah, right? I, I just think the way the internet developed in China is different than the way it developed here. Sure. So that- WeChat could, in effect, colonize all of these functional, you know, social functions, as I think what Zuckerberg calls them. Right. Um, uh, whereas here, various other players filled out, you know, he, Zuck bought some of them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, you'd have to buy, the, if you want Twitter to become WeChat, you have to shut down all the other things that currently. No, I you, don't just, you just have to knock them. It. You just have to knock them out. I, I think that it's knock a, them out. How? Um, how did Friendster die? Did you think Friendster was just going to go crazy? No, it was replaced by something better that did the same thing. Yeah. This is that, that stole the user base and basically offered an instant migration. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. So and, I, and, I use and, WeChat right now, mm -hmm. but because I know how WeChat functions under the hood, I have a separate phone that only has WeChat installed on it. You know, and it's a Samsung, you know, low end phone. Well so done. I can have conversations with people I need to have conversations with in Asia. But I re recognize that it sucks all the stuff off of it. So it doesn't have anything else on it. You air right? it. It, is, it is the WeChat device. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if Twitter starts to go in that direction, I'll have a Twitter device. OK. Um, and that's how I'll, you know, put a little skiff around, you know, that that world. If that's what it evolves into. Right. Is it mm -hmm. it's a must have. And it's like, but. It'll be a single purpose, you know, yeah. system for me. So, so right. Mika, I'm not saying I'm not saying that turning Twitter into WeChat is going to be a successful strategy. Uh, I'm saying it's a really good ambition for may. somebody who wants to take over, <laughs> who wants to take over Twitter to do something different with it. Because, uh, you know, in the U.S., nobody's sort of tried to do that, and I don't think it's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's the Swiss army knife problem, which is if you give people too many things to do, they won't know what to do. Um, so I, I, look, I, I think he's, he's really, uh, he's scary um, because of how much power uh, and, and what a large following he's developed. Mm -hmm. And he does seem to be um, really poorly informed, but surrounded by enablers, and yeah, not good. And so, bringing Trump back is just only one bad thing he'll do, yeah. <laughs> one of several. I wanted to bounce yeah. quickly over to Trump and the document fiasco. Yeah. Like, is, this, is this the place where he gets stuck in the tar and actually gets sucked under properly? Yeah, he may be indicted by um, the Justice Department. Yeah. 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 And, and if that, that happens, then Jamey gets uh, uh, to see just how brittle we are. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I said this here last month or whether I've just been thinking it or or whatever over the over the past over over the past month. But the you know there are three outcomes: um, indicted and convicted. Right. We yeah. get um, get violence violence up up front, but it's better for the for democracy in the long term. Right. Um, not indicted, not convicted. Um, no, you know, little violence up front, awful for democracy in the long run. Right. Indicted and using this finger intentionally, in indicted but not convicted is the worst possible option. Like, yeah, because because not, like it's impeachments. Yeah. You know, and, well, even worse than that, because this is. Yeah. You can you can make the the claim that impeachment is a political process, blah, blah, blah. This is the this is a court ruling right. him innocent, which he's right. not. But that's not the point. He, yeah. He's that's what he would claim. He would basically it would be all the evidence he needs to be yeah. able to demonstrate that he was unfairly attacked because this it's was all it, it was. A, it was a witch hunt. It was a uh, it, it was an illegitimate attack upon me and upon you, my you know, my people. Um, they hate you, you know, my faithful um, minions. Which we actually, you know, they they hate you, and so if my biggest fear is that he gets indicted and doesn't get convicted, because that would have all of the the upfront violence of the indictment, right, and have all of the damage and plus to the, democracy as a system, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so. Yeah. I, and I think that that is a recognize that the people in the Justice Department recognize that. Yeah, that Garland recognizes that. And so I am not one hundred percent convinced that he will be indicted, no matter how guilty he appears, no matter how much evidence is there. If they cannot be absolutely certain, absolutely beyond a doubt certain of getting a conviction, and Franklin because Ford indictment with no conviction is so dangerous. Yeah, Franklin Ford just posted a thing saying that indictment was inevitable. Uh, I didn't have a chance to read the whole thing, but I'll post the uh, I'll post the link in the chat. Yeah, I, I'm planning to read that too. Yep, Garland Garland's an institutionalist who will say, at the end of the day, I have to indict because I think he broke the law and we have a case. 
there's no way but through yep ugly so ugly like like the next couple months ugly hey the next couple of weeks in uh, brazil oh god yeah 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 but Bolsonaro um, scored much higher than the polls said he would. So, uh... mm -hmm. and uh, you have the election at the end of the month, or the, se the second round election at the end of the month, and you already have uh, uh, early signs of uh, big violence, especially if Bolsonaro doesn't come out uh, on top. Yeah. Um, um, a, question, a question that arose yesterday in conversation around Iran and the Veil protests. Why aren't America's famous women all over that and backing uh, Iran's women and girls like Oprah and Hillary and Kamala and other other powerful women? Why are they not like why why haven't they jumped in? You think they need compensation for it? No, it, it's it's cl it's class allegiance. I mean. This Oprah has a, a lot huge, more in common with Elon than, than she issue. does with with the uh, his accusers. Huh. Uh, I would say the answer is because it hasn't become popular to do that, and none of the people you just named are leaders. They're followers. Mm -hmm. They don't take risks. Um, so, and at the base level of uh, why aren't more of us doing more uh, because of exhaustion and fragmentation. Um, there's a lot of shit going on. There is. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. the Iranian elections protests that happened in, oh God, I can't remember what year anymore. Uh, you know, when everybody was uh, turning their avatar green in solidarity with them, uh, happened to come during a bit of a news vacuum and um, I'll, extra bonus points if anyone can name the event that snuffed out Western support for uh, the democracy protests in Iran the last time. In Iran? Um, yeah, big global event that completely caused people to stop paying attention. <laughs> uh, not 9-11? Nope. Mm -hmm. Cold War? Uh, global very traumatic event for a lot of people all right i'll tell you no. it was the death of michael jackson oh jesus come on yeah well I, i'm also so I, gonna... I i wish there was a way to um uh ethan zuckerman tried to do this to measure uh the how much attention and for how long a topic gets and he was he 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 was suggesting that we even come up with a unit of measure called the Kardashian. The Kardashian, yeah. Um, I, think, I think you mentioned this a while ago, and I think I mentioned that I had a polytometrics class at Irvine, yeah. where my term paper was measuring column inches around airplane hijackings to Cuba, mm. and and I noticed that over time the curve plummeted like the earliest hijackings had a long tail there was lots of coverage and then as we kind of got accustomed to hijackings the coverage would would just drop and that's when like the prof said you should use multiple aggression on this and i said multiple what yeah i might then, uh, observe was... that the um uh in, in, for the women in iran is that oprah is irrelevant Okay, it's how long do they want to sustain, all right, this, all right? Yeah. If yeah. Oprah, you know, went on and say, hey, you're Ayatollah, you're, you're not doing the right thing, all right? It, you know, who so, cares? So, but, but I think solidarity with Iran's women and girls from a figure as famous and broad as Oprah would help. I don't think the Ayatollahs are going to do beans, uh, you know, based on what Oprah well, I'm said. I'm saying that the, the, it's the sustainability inside the society of we're fed up. Look, the most important thing that happened in that arena in the last 48 hours is that the men at the oil refinery walked off the job. Yes. Okay. Oil That's strike, the oil most, worker strike now is the you're basically hitting them in the pocketbooks and yeah. saying, we stand in solidarity with you know our women. That's a so, that's a big so deal. I hate to break it to you, Jerry, but uh, <clears throat> here. Damn it! Are you going to trouble me with inconvenient facts? 
another inconvenient truth. So Oprah is speaking out on behalf of the women, Jerry. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. Okay, yes, that, just, that just got me into a total loop. My browser's going crazy. I'm gonna have to find it some other way. Uh, I guess I haven't logged into Instagram for a while. No, I'm not logged I in. I just Googled I, I, Oprah just and click, click right over to it. Yeah. Okay. So the point no, my, that, that Jerry was, it didn't break through to Jerry's consciousness until you pointed it out. So, right. Which, which means it wasn't real until you pointed it out. Well, it was yeah. not, reality well, is I mean, so inconvenient. It, 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 was it in the prime minister's talking points, all right, over in the UK, all right? Does she care? Yeah. No, so it's the mini budget that's derailing her world. So interesting. So I get a, this message is not available. You're being blocked by Oprah. No, you, you may have, have to be logged into Instagram in order yeah, to see. I think that's it. No, no, I, I'm literally, I, I clicked, I did a one click, popped up in Safari, not logged in and went right to her page. Now I do have ad blockers. Yeah. Let me Oprah's go Oprah's blocking you, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have said those bad things about Oprah. Never, right? This the Oprah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not if he's, you know what's good for you. He's ahead of you. Who else did you want to be speaking out on this? Let's see. Uh, Hillary, uh, name name some famous. Here we go. So it is showing. I want. I just opened Firefox, and there it is. Yeah. Gloria Steinem still around? She is. She is. Two cool. weeks ago, Hillary slammed the horrific Iran regime. They're only in power because they oppress women. That'll really help. Yeah. Cool. Thank I you. Think the women of America are at the moment focusing on domestic concerns. Dobbs. Yeah. 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 I think that's the thing. We're we're beleaguered. I mean, my friends are the the feeling of. Uh, exhaustion, beleaguerdness, um, you know, uh, there's also been a lot of turnover at the top of many of the leading uh, women's and feminist organizations in the last year or two. So you have people who are finding their footing. Um, uh, it's, it's not good. It's not, it's not like uh, superheroes are running I mean, things or something. We yeah. know what we're doing, you know, to get weapons to support Ukraine. That's what do you best. smuggle into Iran to support the women? I don't know. Better internet service. I think that was the best idea anybody had. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And still that's, that's, you know, weak in comparison to send them high Mars. Um, yeah. Remember when the State Department was trying to develop a sort of internet in the bot in a box? I sure do. Yeah. Whatever happened to that? The, the thing that the thing that's particularly depressing is that we're trying to prevent a Handmaid's Tale future for the U.S. Yeah. We're we're, we're busy trying to prevent Sharia Christian Sharia law mm -hmm. from becoming the rule of the land. Um, and that the people who've had that as their plan have been working on that for 50 years and have done a very good job. Uh, Televangelicals, I think, right? Nice. Yeah. Televangelicals, yes. Televangelical sounds like a body part that dangles from the body. <laughs> <laughs> have you had your Televangelical removed yet? No, no, it's still still dangling. Y'all, Kata. <laughs> Gosh, Jamey, you, you have another career in sort of stand up gloom yeah <laughs> no no I've, I've these are all these are all the terms that i've seen all over you know Reddit i know i know but you collected them in a nice way and i can just <laughs> this is one of those like five minute ketcha pecha talks or whatever that that's yeah. called or you know 20 slides in five minutes pecha kucha pecha kucha yeah yep Talibangical. Talibangical. Talibangelicals. Yeah, where is George Carlin when you need him? Uh, dead, unfortunately, because he was really awesome. Yeah. Yes, he was. I'll, I'll, he was send, really... you the, I'll send you the uh, humometer under development, Jerry, a right, humor uh -huh. scale, all right, so that you can tell people what mood you're in. <laughs> it's, 
I had one at IBM, right? So that people could know what mood I was in before they walked in my office, right? Randy. Now I've, I've worked with Jim to productize it. So you'll, I'll give it, I'll send it to you. Thank you. <laughs> Is that some kind of because, visual display? Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I don't know that I have it on this computer, but yeah, um, let me look. Is it your avatar chuckling or crying? No, 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 no. Um, let me see here. Long, long ago when I worked for Esther, I liked headset phones because I was on the phone a lot. And I had to train people when they walked into my office to look down at a little triangular thing I put in front of me that I would rotate, look like on the air, like DN, do not disturb, come on in. And, and I don't, I don't remember what the third one was, but I had to train. I had to sort of like, because people would just like come running and talking because I didn't look like I was on the phone. Ah, uh, I had a friend who wore a hat with that kind of indicator on it. If, if the hat on is the on, <clears throat> a good idea. Yeah. Why That's isn't that cut point. on? I have to tell you what pronouns I'm using, but uh, that hasn't come on, caught on. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the. Um, OK, let me see. Here it is. Ooh. So it, it would uh, have a, you know, dry erase marker with it so that you could annotate it and kind of circle where you are. I used to have a post-it that was an arrow. Yeah, yeah. It would move up and down. Uh, you know. But these aren't moods. These are types of humor. Right. Yeah, I know. They're, they're describing from, you know, the, uh, you know, hilarious, which is probably the, you know, at least from my reckoning, you know, a highest down all the way down to satire and sarcasm and mockery, right? As the, the, the darker forms, right? But it's okay. relative. Um, this was my, you know, way of, you know, I would say I'm in a, I'm in a droll mood today, guys, right? I see. Come in and amuse me, okay? Um, but it, as opposed to, puns. you know, we're an assist. I had a lot of days that I would be down here in absurd. <laughs> um but i think it should be a circle not a not a line okay know? the left needs like i said it's right. it, it, it it's a prototype so i welcome your when you say yeah. a circle you think a circle it be, yeah okay. yeah in other words at the bottom where satire is is should circle back around up to hilarity okay all right uh, where are puns good though witty Puns. I'll look. Yeah. Are you feeling are you feeling punny today? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's every day. Every day. All right. So enough. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. It's just we, we we do have a tendency to in these conversations take the edge off of the you know downer nature of this stuff by you know adding yeah, humor. Making fun. Absolutely. Speaking of downer conversations, how is Sri Lanka? It went really well. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So it, it was a two-part thing. Um, the first part was a, um, a a webinar that lasted for about uh, an hour of me. You know, actually, a little bit more than that. Um, they wanted you to originally give like a three-hour speech, right? They wanted something really massive, so they went <laughs> for an hour and a half webinar, um, and then they asked for a recorded keynote that they could play. So I gave them a, a an eleven-minute uh talk um mm -hmm. and they were it was very i w actually watched the beginning of the uh, uh of the um symposium they had because they had all the invited um officials throughout the webinar and all of the interactions i'd had with the, with the folks leading up to the symposium they were very casual um dressed the way you often see people dressed in south asia mm -hmm. uh and the, the at the beginning of the of the symposium so everyone was in a suit and tie everyone was the most formal formally dressed they could be um they had a a good five minutes thanking all the they started with a five minute thanking of all of the people who were involved in getting this going and then they had some kind of ritual um not i don't recall exactly what they were doing but they were reading something in uh what the local language and they had 
two people, one person who was drumming and another person who was um, playing a different, a, a, a different stringed instrument. They were both dressed in what I assume are native or native garb, but like it was like this really scrappy leather thing, but with the kind of cap you would see on like an Oxford graduate. Wow. Uh, kind of weird. Like a bowler uh, or a top uh, hat? Like a pie, yeah, a pie hat, yeah. Um, so that was interesting to watch. Uh, they were very pleased with what I provided because actually rather than just doing a an 11 minute talk, I actually used um, iMovie and inserted images and text overlays and all that kind of fun stuff to make it look semi-professional. Hmm. If you look at my Twitter feed, I've actually posted a link to that talk a couple of days oh, cool. ago. So okay. you, you can actually, it's basically what they asked me to do is um, interpret the, the current situation in Sri Lanka through the lens of Benny. Mm. And since I, you know, uh, so what I talked about that last month, Bo actually sent me some really useful stuff. Um, looking through that, looking through the stuff that they sent, uh, and then trying to squeeze that through this particular language of interpretation was actually kind of an interesting challenge. Um, hmm. And it, it really forced me to say, okay, what do you do with this Banny tool other than say, hey, look, brittle. Um, you, what can you do with it? Well, if you see, if you watch the talk, what I eventually say is, here what you need to Banny is not going to give you the answers. It's not going to give you the solution. It, how, however, it's really useful for pointing out where to look to help you avoid this in the future and sort of go and run down each of the, the four categories and say, okay, there's the kinds of things that you could have been looking out for that you should be looking out for you know, that would be indicative of an increasingly brutal situation, increasingly anxiety-inducing situations. What are the kinds of things that you should have been, that you could be paying attention to? Hmm. And so... It was a nice experience to get a chance to actually exercise this tool. And it was just, I'm still not entirely believing that there was a, a full-on academic symposium entitled The Banny World. That was right. a two-day symposium yeah. uh, with people from not just Sri Lanka, but India and um, Malaysia, I think. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Love that. Cool. I need to go and take Heidi to a an appointment. It was a pleasure to be with you for the full time. Same here. Um, Same here. Thank you. Good to see you all. for all of your uh, gathered intelligence. It was very mm -hmm. refreshing. Thank you. Cheers. Love the Heidi place. Thank you. Yeah. It would be a, it's going to be a very interesting call next month. Oh my God! I know. If we're yeah. still around, we'll be here. Yeah, yeah, you bet. We'll be back. Cheers. All right. We'll take care. Great. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys.